July 1 edition of PFTOT, otherwise known as Bobby Bonilla Day, and that is the only reference in this space to Bobby Bonilla and his $1.2 million that he gets this year and every year through 2035. Good gig if you can get it. Good gig if you can get it is to be the disciplinary officer for the National Football League. Judge Sue L. Robinson sat and waited for two years. Presumably they paid her to be on retainer to sit and wait. She finally had some work to do, and she did it this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the disciplinary hearing for Browns quarterback Deshaun Watson. She has taken the matter under advisement. Briefs are due on July the 11th. My guess would be, and this is just a guess based upon practicing law for almost 20 years, July 25-ish, sometime that week, we'll get a decision. She will receive written materials from both sides. She will put together a written opinion. It will be over under 19 and a half pages, and I'd probably take the over. I think it'll at least be 20 pages. Maybe I should have said over under 20.5, 21.5. I think it will be north of 20 because there's going to be two key ingredients to the final decision. One, her findings of fact, because those findings of fact are binding on Commissioner Roger Goodell if he decides or if he is requested to handle an appeal of her decision. Remember, either side can pursue an appeal unless there's no discipline issued at all. At that point, it's over. Any discipline imposed, Sean Watson can appeal and ask for less. The league can appeal and ask for more. Both could happen. Both could be sufficiently unhappy with the outcome that one side wants less and the other side wants more. But her findings of fact are binding on the appeal process. So how she explains what the facts are based upon the evidence that was presented. More on that in a second. The other key part of her ruling obviously will be the ruling, the decision, how she takes those facts and applies the law to them. That's always important in any legal setting. And here the law is the personal conduct policy. What is prohibited under the personal conduct policy as reflected by how the conduct policy has been applied in the past, whether it is a finding of evidence of some form of sexual assault or whether she decides that there's been a violation of the general catch-all prohibition on any conduct that undermines the integrity of the NFL, the league, or any of its member teams. That is a very broad prohibition that possibly applies to Deshaun Watson. So she determines the facts, then she applies the personal conduct policy to the facts, and she reaches a decision. Now, there's definitely some optimism that things went well for Deshaun Watson, in large part because, and as we reported last night, the NFL's presentation of evidence, they interviewed a dozen of the women who have made accusations against Deshaun Watson, obviously sexual misconduct during massage therapy sessions. For those of you just new to the story, it's been around for about 15 and a half months now. Spoke to 12 of the women, focused on five of the cases. My understanding is, and this comes from a person with knowledge of the proceedings, no evidence of any violence committed, no evidence of any threats of violence, no evidence of any coercion, no evidence of any duress, no evidence that would constitute assault or battery or anything that would trigger that six game baseline suspension. There's a six game baseline suspension that was one of the products of the Ray Rice situation where the NFL beefed up the personal conduct policy and created that six game suspension as the not, not minimum, but baseline. It can go down, it can go up based upon mitigating or aggravating factors, but it's a baseline of six. If you don't have any evidence of any assault, any violence, anything that would fall under that category, the six game minimum suspension doesn't apply as to any of the individuals, none of them. You've got five different cases that were brought to Judge Robinson. If you have no evidence of assault in any of them, you don't have a six game baseline suspension for any of them. So, and I'm approaching this very logically. That's what happens. You've got the allegations that are made. You've got the court of public opinion that reacts. But then at some point, somebody wearing a black robe has to decide 
what is, is the law and what are the facts and how do they intersect? And if you don't have evidence of actual assault, if you can't prove, and the NFL has got the burden here, if you can't prove that an assault happened, you go 0 for 5 in your effort to get to the baseline six-game suspension. You don't even get close to a year. See, there had been a loose sense, and I fault Deshaun Watson's camp for not effectively creating the narrative and pushing back and explaining to reporters and providing smoking gun evidence that helps show that some of these cases may not be very strong. This is on them. When Tony Busby was scoring body blow after body blow in the court of public opinion, and Watson's camp wasn't doing anything other than saying, oh, there's no crime in seeking a happy ending. I mean, you need something better than that to convince people. Folks were looking at it saying, hey, there's 24 claims against the guy, soon to be 26. Must have done something wrong. 24? Hey, Ben Roethlisberger got four games for two claims. Hmm, 24 claims must have 48 games coming. That was what people thought. And Watson's camp never did anything to fill in that void or correct that, that logical misperception of where things were heading. So, 24 became 12, became five, five. That's it. That's all the NFL looked at, five. And if in none of those five, you have any evidence of violence, coercion, threat, duress, nothing that would trigger the six game baseline suspension subject to mitigation or aggravation and obviously the aggravating factors would be here hey there's 24 of these claims in all we need to do more than six but if you never get to the point where six is on the table where are you where are you at that point at that point your best argument if you're the league is that well we've got a guy who had a habit slash fetish frankly let's call it what it is of getting massages, and trying to make those massages into sexual encounters. And even though we've been unable to prove that there was anything that rose to the level of assault under the personal conduct policy, the mere fact that he was going around person to person using social media to arrange these sessions and hoping that most, if not all of them, would become a sexual encounter, That's the kind of behavior that undermines the integrity of the NFL. That's the kind of thing that requires an intervention. You know, at the end of the day, it's kind of what they did to Ben Roethlisberger. They didn't have any proof of assault. So they looked at the behavior that gave rise to the allegations. Said you're engaging in conduct that puts you in the position where you're going to face these kinds of accusations. You're involved in human interactions that logically lead to someone having a problem with how you're acting. So that would be the argument. Well, you know, we can't prove an actual assault. Sorry, we tried. We tried. Didn't work. But this man must be punished because he has engaged in behavior that undermines the integrity of the NFL, its teams, et cetera. That's when this issue of proportionality comes into play. Robert Kraft, owner of the Patriots, very different case. No accusation of any wrongdoing, no NDAs, no lawsuits. Kraft was charged with solicitation. The charges eventually were thrown out because of gross overreach by authorities in secretly recording these sessions, secretly recording people who were going in just for massages, massage only, not massage plus, massage period. They were being recorded. Horrible, horrible violation of privacy rights. That was the centerpiece of Robert Kraft's defense, and the case was dismissed. But he was still charged with solicitation, with a massage becoming something more than a massage. And as we reported last night, the league acknowledged that its security department investigated the Kraft situation, and ultimately Kraft was not punished. So if, if the investigation resulted in the conclusion that one of the owners of the 32 NFL teams got a massage that became a sexual encounter and he wasn't disciplined 
for conduct that undermines the league, its teams, et cetera, or puts people at risk. It's just, hey, this is the kind of behavior that's only going to lead to trouble for the shield. We better punish anyone who engages in this kind of behavior. If you didn't punish Kraft for it, and the policy says owners are held to a higher standard, how do you punish Watson? How do you do it? That's really the bottom line here. And this is a benefit of the clarity that has emerged from the process and what we've reported on what happened during the proceedings. Now, I still fault Watson's camp for trying to attack with a sledgehammer and not a scalpel. Because someone, whether it's Rusty Harden, David Mulligetta, or someone else, someone should have been talking to someone in the media and explaining in very logical, simple terms. Here's what's going to happen at this hearing. They're going to try to prove that there was assault. They're not going to be able to prove it. There's no allegation. There's no proof of violence or threats of violence. They're not going to be able to trigger the six game baseline suspension. So then they're going to fall back to, well, we can't have a guy going out and getting massage after massage after massage and hoping it becomes a sexual encounter when they have an owner who they didn't discipline for allegedly having a massage that became a sexual encounter. And my, my assumption is the investigation that was done by the league came to the conclusion that, yeah, that's what happened. Massage became a sexual encounter. If you don't discipline Robert Kraft in any way, how do you discipline Deshaun Watson? Do you say, well, Kraft did it once. Watson did it a bunch of times. Did they introduce evidence of Watson doing it a bunch of times? They folks, did, did they introduce evidence of 66 at least or 100 or more? All the inflammatory things that Tony Busby has put out there or the things that have been reported? If all they have is five, that potentially didn't even become sexual encounters. That's the other side of it, too. If they focused all their eggs on the basket of five people who were offended by his behavior during massage therapy sessions that didn't even become sexual encounters, how do you even discipline him for massages that became sexual encounters? See, we know a lot of stuff as members of the court of public opinion. All that matters for Judge Robinson is the evidence that was introduced Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I'm not gonna be surprised if he's not suspended at all. I'm not. And again, it's sad and unfortunate that there wasn't a better effort to push back against the Tony Busby media offensive because it's too late to put the horse back in the barn. And one of the problems they're going to have, if Judge Robinson imposes little or no punishment at all on Deshaun Watson, the problem they have is people are going to lose their minds. People who have only been following this at a very casual distance, they hear 24 allegations. They see bits and pieces of the Ashley Solis interview with HBO's Real Sports or this or that or whatever. They have an expectation in mind that at the end of the day, the NFL, hey, Roger Goodell, he's the enforcer. He's going to take care of this situation. Remember, Roger Goodell is never going to be accused of being too lenient on anyone after the Ray Rice case nearly brought him down. Well, with Sean Watson... It's not Roger Goodell's decision. See, this new procedure, which gives players some voice of independence that makes the decision before it gets appealed to Roger Goodell, if it even gets appealed there, 
the league can say we didn't make this decision. Now, the league may have blown the case. The league may have done a better job. It could have done a better job of producing evidence that would have gotten what the league wants. I mean, it is going to be kind of weird for the league to say, well, we wanted a minimum suspension of a year. Well, what's your evidence? Here's our evidence. Well, why the hell did you want a one-year suspension based on that? And that's going to be one of the things I look at very carefully in the final decision we get from Judge Robinson. What did the league introduce and why would the league have thought a one-year suspension was justified based upon the evidence it introduced? And maybe the league just kind of threw the fight. Maybe the league knew. Maybe the league knew at the end of the day it really didn't have anything, but it had to puff its chest out and demand a one-year suspension so no one would say the commissioner was being too, too soft on Deshaun Watson. But we'll find out. That's where this goes. We'll have a written ruling that will be released, that will be available, there will be transparency. We'll all have it. I will read it word for word when it comes out, and I will make notes, and I will either be sitting here or upstairs in the PFT Live studio, and I'll explain everything that I glean from it. What does this mean? How did we get here? What does this mean for Deshaun Watson or others? What kind of precedent has been set here? Is it persuasive? Are there flaws? And Judge Robinson needs to have a bulletproof opinion in writing that makes it understandable why she's doing what she's doing. And it needs to be understandable, not just for the lawyers in the crowd. It needs to be something that is understandable by the average person who may be inclined to read it. Now, most people aren't going to read it. But in the event that the average person is curious and wants to see, well, why, why did he get far less of a suspension than the league wanted? Why wasn't he punished at all? Let me go read this and see. You don't want that person to shut down on page one. There's a lot of gobbledygook and legalese that gets into these things. It needs to be clean. It needs to be understandable. It needs to engage the reader from the first, not just paragraph, but from the first word. You don't need some, some legal term to start it all off and the person just shuts down and says i'm not even going to try to decipher this thing it needs to be cleared it needs to be understandable and it needs to make the case it needs to build the wall one brick at a time as to why judge robinson decided what she decided and you know to the extent that there is going to be a media offensive and i wrote something about that today at pft that maybe next week we're going to start seeing a more aggressive effort by watson's camp to push back against the four remaining cases 20 of them are now officially settled to the extent that that happens, it's useful to Watson, to the Browns, to the league, to the union, and to Judge Robinson, because we're now in the range where the expectations need to be properly set as to what's coming. And if a suspension far less than what the NFL wanted, and possibly no suspension at all, if that's what's coming based upon the quality of the evidence the NFL brought forward, people need to be ready for it. Because if that ruling comes out, and what you do when you get this long ruling, the first thing you do is you go to the last page and see what the decision is. It's a final line will say what it is. That's what everybody will do. Once people see that, if it is less than what the league wanted, far less than what the league wanted, if it's no suspension at all, no violation of the personal conduct policy, there's going to be some people wondering what the hell happened. Now, again, Roger Goodell's got some buffer here. He's got some protection. He's not the one making the decision. It's Judge Sue L. Robinson, jointly hired, jointly compensated by the League and the Union. He's got protection. And if she finds no discipline whatsoever, there isn't a damn thing he can do about it. See, it gets awkward if she would find one game, two games, four games a fine, whatever, any discipline. And the league then has to decide, do we appeal it? But even if they appeal it, they are bound by the facts as determined by Judge Robinson. They can't disagree with her facts. They can't say, well, we respect what she said, but we think something else happened. We think that things she didn't take into account are relevant to the decision on appeal. No, the appeal is driven by the facts as determined by Judge Robinson. So even though Roger Goodell still has final say, his hands are going to be tied if Judge Robinson writes the opinion the correct way and 25 years on a federal bench tells me that maybe she will, she's going to paint him into a corner 
and he's not going to be able to do much more. And maybe that's why they were putting out the word earlier this week that maybe they won't appeal. Maybe they're starting to realize that this new procedure may not be quite as favorable to the league as they thought, may not give them that last chance to do whatever they want to do, and they may have to accept these rulings, whatever they may be. And it would have made more sense then to just let someone else handle the appeal. I think having the commissioner have the appeal is that that one last safety valve that the league has for a case when, for whatever reason, it really wants to make sure a guy gets more by way of suspension than the independent process would give him. So that's where we are. Keep an eye on July 25. That's two weeks or so after she gets the briefs. It gives her enough time to write a lengthy opinion, think about it, make sure it looks good, revise it, revise it, revise it, revise it. Don't create the appearance it was rushed. Two weeks is just about enough time. You know, she may have other stuff going on too in her law practice that she can't just throw out the window. So I think between the 25th and the end of that week, we'll get something. And we'll be back from hiatus by then. So we'll be ready to react to whatever the decision may be and what it all means. And that disconnect, bridging that gap between court of public opinion and the court of the shield. In the court of the shield, things may go much better for Deshaun Watson than they have gone in the court of public opinion or may go in civil court. Today is the one year anniversary of one of the smartest PR moves the NFL ever made. July 1, 2021, Thursday, heading into a four day 4th of July weekend. A lot of people had Friday the 2nd off. A lot of people had Monday the 5th off because the 4th fell on a Sunday. The NFL knew that anything that happened on Thursday the 1st was not going to be anything that really registered or was remembered when Tuesday the 6th rolled around. So that's when they dropped, middle of the afternoon, the outcome of the investigation that lasted 10 months into a decade or longer of workplace misconduct within the Washington Commanders organization. And I remember that afternoon vividly. And I remember as I was processing all of this, well, where's the report? Where's the report? Where's the report? For everything else of this magnitude, we get the report. Deflategate, multiple hundreds of pages. The bully scandal with Jonathan Martin and Richie Incognito, significant, lengthy, detailed report. We'll get a significant, lengthy, detailed report from Judge Robinson on Deshaun Watson. Why was there nothing from the commanders? And that's when we got this clunky excuse that defies logic and common sense, but they just keep repeating it. They just keep repeating it. They repeat it with a clear voice and a confident demeanor and... It's like saying the world is flat or two plus two is five. The NFL's argument, because some of the current and former employees of the Washington Commanders requested anonymity, the league decided to make everything secret. Every fact, every finding, everything that was learned by Beth Wilkinson during her 10 month investigation became a big secret. And that's the only way we could properly honor the requests of these brave employees who came forward seeking anonymity. And they were using basically these folks as human shields because they didn't want this stuff to come out. And I remember thinking at first, they just want to protect Daniel Snyder because if all this stuff comes out, it's going to be untenable for him to continue as the owner of the team. And then it occurred to me, no, they're protecting themselves because they don't want to give any other disgruntled employees out there a roadmap for potentially getting an owner out. You make an allegation. The NFL decides they better investigate. They send in a lawyer to investigate. And that lawyer is looking for all sorts of other things. And you never know what the lawyer is going to find. And you may find under a rock the magic bullet that takes out the owner. And then the next thing you know, that owner's got to sell. Now, with Snyder, I mean, that's the irony here. He's never going to sell. They can't make him sell. There's no new automatic regime that takes over. They cannot force him to sell the team and he will sue and he will sue and he will sue and he will fight and he will never give in. And he may know some things about his partners. He may know a few things that if you sufficiently piss him off, he decides he's going to share 
with reporters, with authorities, with whoever. And see, what happened and what continues to happen before the U.S. House Oversight Committee wouldn't have occurred if the John Gruden emails, the emails sent to and received from Bruce Allen, former team president, had never been leaked to the media. If that doesn't occur, I don't think Congress ever pays attention because it was over, it was done. The Gruden situation created kind of a backlash after the fact over this idea that why is this all secret? Why is it just these Gruden emails? There must be a lot of other crap in here. Why was it all brushed under the rug? And there was a push for transparency in the Washington commander's investigation months after it ended, months after July 1. If those emails that John Gruden had sent and received hadn't been weaponized against him, none of this ever would have happened. This one-year anniversary of the NFL's brilliant PR move may not even be noticed, making it even more brilliant PR move. That The fact that somebody gave those Gruden emails to the media undermined what would have been one of the best and smartest and most adroitly exercised PR moves of any American sports league or any American business because they had pulled it off. Announced it July 1. By July 6, it was over. And I remember that weekend, I'm thinking, this is, this is too big to just ignore. There's no way that when July 6 rolls around, this is going to be ignored. And it was ignored. And it just kind of went away. And training camps opened. See, that's the thing. The NFL's always got some bright, shiny objects that they can dangle. And you move on to something else. And that's what happened. So kudos, National Football League. It was a great PR play. It would have worked if somebody hadn't leaked the John Gruden emails. And now the NFL's best PR efforts being devoted to trying to prevent this commander's thing from completely exploding as they try to track down Daniel Snyder somewhere on his super yacht beyond the reach of federal process servers who are trying to deliver a subpoena that would secure his testimony before the oversight committee, before the Republicans take back control of the House, if that's indeed what happens in November. And as of December 31, the investigation of the Washington commanders ends because the Republicans have no interest in pursuing it, as the ranking member of the committee recently told the Washington Times. A couple other things before we answer some questions. The Baker Mayfield scenario, I don't know how it's going to play out. We don't know if anybody's going to trade for him in the weeks leading up to training camp. We don't know if they're going to release him if they can't find a trade partner. But the comments this week from Baker Mayfield make it clear to me that he's not going to just sit home, that he's not going to just go along. If the Browns say, well, you know, we really wish we had a trade partner now, but we don't. Can you just hang in there? Can you do us a solid and hang in there while we try to find somebody to trade for you and work out how much of the salary we're going to pay and how much they're going to pay and what kind of a draft pick we're going to Can you just hang on? And, you know, maybe one of these quarterbacks is going to get injured. And it's going to create an opportunity to be a great opportunity for you because we can trade you to that team. And then you walk through the door and you're the starter. So just, just stay home, just stay in shape, wait for the call. We'll let you know. Can you just do that for us? Now he did it for mandatory minicamp. I don't think he's going to do it for training camp. I think he's going to be there. And they already have enough issues now by the time training camp rolls around. Maybe the Deshaun Watson distractions will be over for the most part. Maybe they'll be very happy about it. Maybe they'll have plenty of a capacity to focus their attention on Baker Mayfield because, hey, we came out of the Deshaun Watson thing feeling pretty good about where we are. So, yeah, Baker, you want to show up? Come on in. We don't care. We'll play hardball. That's where I'm fascinated by where this can go. Baker Mayfield decides to play hardball. I'm going to be here every day. And, oh, you know what? Every chance I have to talk to the media, I'm going to tell them I want out. I don't want to be here, but I am here because I'm taking advantage of these fine state-of-the-art facilities and I'm getting my reps in. I'm keeping myself in shape and I'm ready to go once I am traded or released. And please trade me or release me right now. He does that every day. And that's fine. But you know what the Browns are going to do? The Browns are going to watch to see if he does anything that would justify cutting him under the same reasoning that the Ravens cut Earl Thomas during camp two years ago for personal conduct detrimental to the best interest of the team. Because even though his salary is guaranteed, it's only guaranteed for skill, injury, and cap. 
And the Ravens' argument against Thomas was, we're not cutting you because of skill, injury, or cap. We're cutting you because of personal conduct that is contrary to the best interest of the team, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's their nuclear option if they want to go that way. And we'll see. We'll see. You know, it's, it's kind of shades of Terrell Owens all over again. Not that he's going to be doing shirtless driveway sit-ups, but there is a way that Mayfield can put pressure on the team as long as he stops short of doing something that would allow the team to say, you've engaged in personal conduct detrimental to the best interest of the team, and we're going to cut you, and we're not going to pay you, and you're going to have to come after us through the grievance process to try to get your money. You're just going to be a free agent. And this $18.8 million is going to be tied up in an arbitration process for two or three years. That may be what the Browns are thinking. And if things go well for the Browns in Deshaun Watson's case, maybe the Browns are going to be more emboldened to play that game with Baker Mayfield. I still think the Browns should treat it as a sunk cost. I think the Browns should cut and run. They should take what they can. It's wrong to do what they've done to Baker Mayfield. And uh, we'll see how that all plays out. But that's something to keep an eye on as we get closer and closer to camp. Will Baker Mayfield play hardball with the Browns? Will the Browns play hardball with Baker Mayfield? And will the two sides find a way out that results in Baker Mayfield having a full and fair chance to become the week one starter and have the kind of a season that will result in him hitting the open market next year and getting a major contract? All right, let's answer a few questions. Let's see what we got here. It's been so long that I got to completely reset the app and find the tweet from today. And what do we have? PFT PM Posse, if the NFL adopted your suggestion for Watson's punishment as a one-year suspension already served in $10 million fine, would slash should they then donate the $10 million to the alleged victims and any future victims that come up? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. I, look, the NFL takes fine money and it distributes it to specific charities that have been pre-designated by the league. I think the idea that we're going to take that $10 million and somehow funnel it back to his victims, I don't think the league would do that. I think that the money, if they would, and, and I, the world has changed since I first threw out this idea of let's just treat last year as time served and, and take his salary away from him after the fact, that 10 million. I think if that would happen, and I don't think we're going in that direction now, it would just go into the regular and normal fund where player fines go, which is a variety of charities that the NFL supports. Neil watches PFT. How do you think teams will use the three game preseason compared to the four game preseason? Will they use game three or game two as the dress rehearsal game? Well, they did it last year and every team handled it all differently. The, the one thing that we saw though, is generally speaking, fewer reps for key players in the preseason. And I don't think any of the preseason games, and it's been a year and, you know, I don't know what I'm remembering or not remembering at this age, but it wasn't that sense like it used to be week three of the preseason, all the starters played into the second half. Every team handles it differently. Some teams don't play their starters at all. Some teams play their starters sparingly. Some teams use them a little more extensively. So I just think generally speaking, we're going to see less and less from starters in a three game preseason. And that that's good for them. That allows them to properly prepare for the 17 game grind that is coming. PFT PM Posse, does Article 46, Section 5 of the CBA contradict the NFL's usual argument that the commissioner exempt list isn't actually a suspension since Section 5 offsets any suspension by uh, becoming a suspension after the fact? Look, the NFL continues to believe that paid leave is not punishment, period, because the player got paid. And I... I just noticed for the first time the other day, the idea that the ultimate suspension gets credited back against the paid leave. Because I remember when Adrian Peterson resolved his case in 2014, he still got a six game suspension on the back end. I think it was six, even though he had missed more than that on paid leave. So it's a bonus for the players who have already missed time. They just have to give up the money that they earned while they were on paid leave. But I don't think it changes the NFL's position. The NFL has already taken that very firm position, and I think won in a, in a grievance with the NFLPA that it is not punishment to put a player on paid leave because he receives his full pay. 
Neil watches PFT. Will the NFL ever get close to the craziness of the NBA offseason? It seems like every year one of the league's top 10 players moves. Uh, aren't we kind of there? Aren't we there with Russell Wilson? Aren't we there with Devontae Adams? Aren't we there with A.J. Brown? Although that wasn't at the start of free agency. That happened during the first round of the draft. We're kind of at the point where the best NFL players who don't want to be on their teams anymore don't want to be paid. I forgot to mention Tyree Kill. The teams are going to accommodate them. We want volunteers, not hostages. That mindset initially crept into the NFL via the quarterback position. It's now making its way through the receiver position, and I suspect it's a trend that's going to continue. So, yes, the NFL is becoming more like the NBA, and this year's free agency proved it. Last year's proved it, and next year's I think will prove it all over again. PFT PM Posse, where did the fumble through the end zone is a turnover and a touchback rule come from? It was one of those that's just always been there. But one of the ways it was explained to me when I was doing the research for Playmakers, still available wherever you buy your books, if you haven't bought it already, and if you haven't, shame on you. If you actually are so interested in our content that you are consuming 40 minutes in to the July 1 edition of the show that we use to replace the show that takes a break during the slow time in the NFL calendar, and you haven't bought the book that's over my shoulder, what the hell is wrong with you? Anyway. The rule has always been there. And the way it was explained to me when I was researching the aforementioned playmakers was there was a time in the NFL where if you threw a pass into the end zone and it fell incomplete and landed on the grass of the end zone itself, the other team got the ball on the 20. So, you know, this is the Chris Sims view. It's like the DMZ. It's like North Korea. It's some special piece of carpet on the broader gridiron that is sacred. And even though it doesn't make any sense, it just is. Because once you cross that plane, it's a different plane of existence. So it's kind of always been that way. And I don't see them ever changing it. The only way they ever change it is if it happens in a Super Bowl and you've got 50 million people who aren't avid viewers of the NFL who simultaneously say, what the F was that? That's when it changes. All right, let's see what else we have. Tommy Caruso, why didn't the players in the NFLPA take a stronger stance on trying to strip Roger Goodell of his power to be judged during an execution or his Rick Kangaroo court during the last CBA negotiations? They have seen it fail many times before. What will it take to get that to finally go away? Well, look, they, they managed to make Roger Goodell the prosecutor and the appeals court. But the judge and the jury is now this independent disciplinary officer. So they have carved out a major chunk of the commissioner's control. And as I understand it, he wanted it that way. He wants some distance because nothing good comes from trying to strike the balance with these very difficult issues. I went too far. Now I'm being criticized. I didn't go far enough. Now I'm being criticized. Now there's somebody else they can point to and say, hey, it's independent. They made the decision. So I don't think it's ever completely gone. But we're going to learn, I think, through this Deshaun Watson case that the commissioner's power has been significantly reduced. Old Top 97 asks, with the possibility of league expansion to 40 teams in the future, are there any markets that could be labeled as sleepers that you could see getting an NFL franchise, Portland or Omaha, for example? One of the things to keep in mind is that stadium size could start to shrink. And I think some owners already realize that for the money they make off of the upper deck of a game, it's not worth the money that it costs to have extra security, extra ticket takers, extra concessions workers, extra parking, everything that goes along with filling that upper deck. It's just not a good business model. So maybe a 35 to 40,000 seat stadium works. Well, I don't know, Oklahoma City. Does that put Oklahoma City in play for an NFL team? It puts smaller markets on the board if you think you can get away with a 35 to 40,000 seat stadium because the future of the NFL, as legalized gambling continues to spread and as the bigger states begin to inch toward having their own gambling programs, it doesn't matter where the games are played. They want the stadiums to be full. You don't want it to look like USFL games but you'll want 
to have games on TV. Doesn't matter where, you just want the games on TV. Now, it can't be some rinky-dink little town that is beneath the cachet of the NFL. I think that's part of the problem. But the reality is having that city attached to the NFL gives the city cachet, like Jacksonville. What did the NFL do for Jacksonville? Was Jacksonville regarded as a major league city before it got an NFL team? No. So I think that there are plenty of towns out there that would be very interested if the NFL is willing to build 35 to 40,000 seat stadiums and there's a market out there that can fill it up and would take to it. And I'm sure they would. It, it changes everything and it creates more opportunities if, and when the NFL looks to expand. Neil watches PFT, the NFL and NFL PA essentially hope to have the same thing happen, have Deshaun on the field, especially for the playoffs. The NFL needs to punish him for PR purposes though. You pose that 2021 could be considered a suspension. Do you think the public would accept it? And again, I think the ship has sailed on the possibility of a retroactive a suspension. The bigger issue is, will the public accept a short suspension or no suspension? How will the public react? And so much of that comes down to how it's sold. How is the public prepositioned on the possibility of a short or no uh, suspension? What will Judge Robinson's opinion look like? Will it be compelling? Will Reporters take the time to read it, understand it, and explain it. Hey, folks, calm down. Calm down. I know you're upset, but calm down. we got to focus on what the evidence was and what Judge Robinson decided. So it's going to be interesting because if it is six games or less, there's going to be some people who are upset. And Judge Robinson's opinion is going to go a long way toward helping people understand exactly why the punishment was what it ultimately could be. All right. Pauline, with hindsight, do you still believe the story about why Watson sat out last year? Might not the Texans have started to get a hint of his behavior even then? And there's been plenty of talk about this. As I raised the idea of treating last year as time served, Bottom line is Deshaun Watson didn't play last year because of these claims. Yes, he told the Texans, I'm not playing for you anymore. Yes, they didn't want to put him on the field. They wanted to trade him. Somebody would have traded for him if those cases weren't out there. He would have been on a roster week one somewhere else. The uncertainty from criminal charges and the civil cases kept him from being traded, period. Without the off-field issue, he plays last year. That's why, logically, it makes sense to treat last year as a suspension. He didn't play last year because of this off-field issue. Yeah, he got paid. And for the Texans, it was an investment in the future draft picks they were going to get for him. It worked out. They paid him an extra $10 million. They held on to his rights. They got a better trade package this year than they would have gotten last year. But still... Without the 24 accusations, and it was 22 at the time, he would have played last year. That's why I can at least logically justify treating last year as a suspension after the fact if he would pay back the $10 million. But again, I don't think one year is going to be on the table by the time it's all said and done. Interesting question from Neil Watch's PFT. If you could put any NFL player on any NFL team, who would you put where and why? I put Tom Brady on the Dolphins because it almost happened. Now, they wouldn't have Tyree Kill, but I'd like to see what Tom Brady would do with the Dolphins. There's plenty of quarterbacks. I, sorry, Tua and Tua non. Dolphins are ready to contend. It's up to Tua. I said this on WQAM yesterday when I suggested that maybe the Dolphins should be thinking about Baker Mayfield because he'd be an upgrade over Tua. We still don't know what the best of Tua is going to be. We're going to find out this year. And if not, one of these quarterbacks out there that's currently with another team is going to end up with the Miami Dolphins. <laughs> Old top 97. I, you know, I hate talking about my own path, but I'll answer this question. As someone who had a successful career before doing what you do now, do you have, did you have people telling you that you were crazy to change career paths? And also, what advice would you give to people interested in doing the same? It wasn't like I woke up one day and said, you know what I'm going to do? 
I'm going to stop practicing law. Even though I'm doing pretty well, I'm going to stop and I'm going to start writing about the National Football League from my basement in West Virginia. That's not a transition I ever would have made. What happened was I started doing it while I was practicing law. And I went through that apprenticeship phase, even though I didn't have a mentor, I didn't have anybody I was learning from. I was teaching myself day after day, week after week, month after month for four or five years without making a penny. And it was working. It was growing. I wasn't making any money, but I was enjoying it. It was my hobby. And so we got to a point where we started making money and one thing leads to another and here comes NBC. And then that's when I made the shift and I didn't get any pushback then. People understood. Yeah, you're trading in your law practice and your business that you built from literally nothing is aligning with NBC. Yeah, great. Congratulations. Now, if my mom was still alive, she may have wondered what the hell was going on. I know my sister was kind of like, what are you doing now? But yeah, it's, it's very different from saying I am throwing away everything that I've built in my legal career and I'm starting from scratch doing something that I have no idea whether it's going to lead anywhere. I have no idea if I have any aptitude at it. I have no idea if it's going to work. That would have been a gutsy move. That is not the move I would make. And I guess that's my advice for anybody that isn't happy with what they currently do. Don't throw away what you have. Find a way to keep the bird in the hand and find a way to cultivate this other skill as a hobby. Tom Clancy. Tom Clancy worked for an insurance company by day, and he followed his passion of writing these ornately detailed military novels at night. If you really love it, it's not work. Oh, it's like working two jobs. If you really enjoy it, it's not. If you really enjoy it, your job is your job, and your your passion is your hobby. And if you're lucky, after eight years, which is what it was for me, the thing that you love doing becomes the thing that you do all the time. Old Top 97, another question. Are billionaire owners asking for taxpayer money to build their cathedrals the biggest ripoff in taxpayer spending, or is it just me? I, look, there are plenty of ways that taxpayer money either doesn't get properly collected or gets wasted. I think the public sentiment has changed dramatically over the past decade against using public money to pay for stadiums. And, and any time one of these measures lands on a ballot, it fails miserably. In every one of these cities where they find a way to give free money to an oligarch, they do it in a way that doesn't require a vote because the average fan would say, no, the average fan isn't a fan. The average person would say, screw that. Why are we giving money to that? But it's that vague threat that is always there that, hey, if we don't do it, someone else will. Oakland wouldn't do it. Las Vegas did it. Buffalo did it because of the vague fear that someone else out there would do it. There's always going to be another community that will buy the monorail that will spend the money to make itself legitimate. And then you're going to be like, oh, we're going to bring in all this money, and the hotels and, and restaurants and people. We want people here. We want to be relevant. This makes us relevant. Let's give this money to somebody who doesn't need it. So they will choose us to be the place that becomes relevant. So I don't see it ending. David Marks with the upheaval of moving across the pond for at least... I'm confused by this. Will there ever be an NFL team based in Europe? Never mind London. I think at some point there will be, as, said, as I've said before, there, there will be two in London at some point. At some point. I don't know when. I hope I live long enough to see it. Another question from Anastasia Williams. Should the Buffalo Bills embrace all the Super Bowl hype or ignore it and let the season play out? Hey, look, here's the, here's the reality. Your players are going to hear it. They're going to hear it. So you better have a plan for dealing with it. As head coach of the team, Sean McDermott needs to have a way to get his players to focus on the task at hand, knowing that they're not robots, knowing that they're not going to be able to shut out the high expectations and the hype. And they got to go about it one week at a time. Remember what happened week one last year? They lost at home to the Steelers. You got to be ready to go out of the gates. You got to find a way to treat yourself as the hunter is not the hunted. And look, for a team that hasn't even been in an AFC championship game, 
how how do you did, were they in the AFC Championship? Well, my memory sucks anymore. Anyway, last year they weren't. Why am I forgetting who was in the AFC Championship in 2020? Am I just trying to forget the entire pandemic year? Maybe I am. Anyway, the bottom line is that the Bills need to forget about the expectations, forget about the hype, forget about what they've done in the past, and Sean McDermott needs to get them focused on each week of the season and find a way to motivate them. Find some basis out there to argue nobody believes in us. Do the Tom Brady thing. Nobody believes in us, even though everybody believes in the Buffalo Bills as 2022 approaches. Ashley Riddler, as Chris isn't here to ask, have you been in your pool yet? I cannot tell a lie. I have not been in my pool yet. Recliner QB. How's your Madden Ultimate team doing this year? Best players? My Madden Ultimate team is at 98. See, this is the thing that happens every year. And I continue to do it every year because it's part of my workout routine. I ride my bike for an hour and I play Madden. And you start with the new version of Madden with a team that is a 59. And you, if you do Ultimate Team, and I enjoy the Ultimate Team. And you work your way up. And I refuse to pay. Sorry, sorry, EA. You don't get any money from me. I know you want my money. I know you want me to, to give in to the lure to make my team better. I do it the old-fashioned way. I earn coins. I earn players. And I work my way up that way. But you spend the year making your team better and better and better and better and better. And you get it to a 98, hopefully to a 99. And then it all starts all over again. But right now, I've got a Tom Brady 99 who is a hell of a runner. I've got Brees Hall and Dalvin Cook in the backfield. I like to do a lot of ground and pound. I got like three or four plays I use over and over again, and they either work or they don't. I find out pretty quickly whether or not I stand a chance when I'm playing in the online leagues that I'm in. You play 10 games. If you get seven wins, you go to the playoffs, and then you go through the playoffs, and then you start it all over again. You keep going higher and higher in the hierarchy, and you see how high you can go and how high you can stay, and they get better as you go higher. But uh, it's fun. I've got mostly 99s right now, and we're just a few weeks away from going back to all 59s. Manuel Villa, does legalized sports betting open the door for certain states to also legalize gambling? And I, it, it seems like in most states where they've embraced sports betting, you've got these apps now where you can go play blackjack and other table games, whether you do it on your phone, whether you do it in person. But I think it's tied to a broader expansion of gambling across the board. Recliner QB, I need to wrap this up. We're getting to some questions that really have nothing to do with football, but what the hell, it's July 1. What Lego sets are you currently working on? The last one you completed. The last one I completed, I put the picture on Twitter of that Ghostbusters house that I bought four years ago. It sat in the box. It was 5,000 pages. It is great therapy for me. It's a nice little blend of things that I can do along with my work. It gets me away from everything. It gives you a different mindset, and it feels like you're actually accomplishing something. And so this Ghostbusters house is done. I have a a, a typewriter and I know exactly where I'm going to put it when it's done. It's a very detailed, intricate, apparently working except for the ink and stuff, but you press the keys and the, the, the hammer goes up. Uh, it's an actual old school typewriter. I haven't started it yet. It's probably going to sit there for multiple years until I realize, you know, I got some time where I can finally start this thing and let's go ahead and do it. And after that, I'm done because you need to have space to put the things. I got, I got a Seinfeld set for Christmas last year. That's what got me back into it. I got a rocket in my office. This is the original Saturn V rocket that was a pain in the ass to build. But again, it's therapeutic. The Ghostbusters house, typewriter. After that, I am done until I find the next one that I want to do. All right, I'm just scrolling to see what else is here. What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? Good question from Tommy Caruso. Let's wrap up with this. Let me just see what else we have before we do that. Yeah, let's do that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to anybody else who's asked a question I haven't gotten to, but I've been going for almost an hour now. I mentioned the fact that the running of the statute of limitations on the civil cases against Deshaun Watson next March, assuming that he stopped with the Instagram massages in March of 2021, will factor into the NFL's decision. What about the fact that a criminal charge could still be possible with a different statute of limitations and can linger over his head for years? I just think there's a point where you just have to move forward. Yes, there is a possibility that somebody that we don't know about will make another criminal charge. Yes, there's a possibility that this time around it will result in an indictment. I, I just think that you, you can't just put your life on pause. And at this point, the NFL has made its case 
and the NFL has gone forward with the evidence of which it's aware. And if it would become aware of somebody else, then it could try to start the process all over again, if that would result in criminal charges. But I think with each passing day, the chances of that happening will reduce. However, and I'll say this, and this is what I'll wrap with. If the end result of Judge Robinson's analysis of the case is that there will be little or no punishment at all for Deshaun Watson, if that's what happens, that could be the thing that gets someone who is out there, who has chosen to be silent, who has chosen to protect herself from having her life turned upside down to come forward with a civil case or a criminal complaint. That a sense that justice wasn't done by the NFL could be the thing that gets someone else to come forward to try to rectify the sense of injustice her own way. Remember, the Harris County DA said a couple of weeks ago, just because Deshaun Watson wasn't indicted doesn't mean that he won't face some other criminal consequence. There are other ways to get justice. Don't presume it's an injustice until we know what else is going to happen. What happens in civil court, what happens with the NFL is critical. If there's a sense that an injustice was done in the NFL's procedures, that could be the thing that gets someone to come forward that we otherwise don't know about. So keep in mind that possibility as the days and weeks go forward. We'll take Monday off since it is the 4th. I'll be back on Tuesday the 5th with another edition of PFTOT. I'll tell you this, though. We're not taking off any day this weekend. Any news, any developments, anything happening in the NFL, we'll have an update for you at profootballtalk.com. Have a safe and happy 4th of July weekend. And let me emphasize safe. It's been several years now since Jason Pierre-Paul had his fireworks mishap. Be smart with yourself, with your family members, when you're handling fireworks, almost every firework has the very simple and basic instruction, light fuse and get away. Emphasis on the get away. Keep yourself safe, keep yourself alive, and we'll reconvene on Tuesday. Have a great weekend. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.